think I just discovered perpetual energy there. <laughs> it never stop. Well, good morning. Uh, please find, I guess everybody's sitting down. I don't have to tell you to find your seats. Uh, welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Columbia. I'm Phil Turner. That's why I wear a name tag. I keep looking down there because <laughs> I'm your service leader for today. To those of you who are here with us in the sanctuary, please be advised that this service is being streamed. Also, let me remind you that we have a pre and post service Zoom event, which also runs the stream of the service. Please make sure you read the announcements in your printed order of service. Also, and especially, be sure to read that wonderful weekly events that comes out each Thursday, as well as the Enneagram, and don't forget to check out our website. I happen to sleep with the web mistress. So. <laughs> <laughs> Please practice social distancing and mask wearing per board approved guidelines. They are new guidelines. At this moment, approved guidelines are that while masking is optional, we strongly recommend that masks are worn inside the sanctuary by those two years or older, and that masks must be worn during singing. Today's flowers are provided by Mary and Morgan McLaughlin who give these flowers to remember the 50th anniversary of their arrival here in Columbia on July 4th, 1972, and also to remember the 11th anniversary of Mary's mother's death on July 8th, 2011. Mary's mother was almost 99 at the time of her death. And now let us center ourselves for today's service and remember to silence all electronic devices. I'm glad that was in there. As we listen to the prelude. We welcome Karen Peters this morning as our violist. And this morning's prelude is Telemann's Concerto in G Major, the fourth movement. Thank you, Karen and Anna. Please stand and join with me in the Congregational Covenant 
It's found in your order of service. Love is the doctrine of this congregation. The quest for truth is its sacrament, and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve others in community, thus do we covenant with one another. Please be seated. Our minister is the Reverend Stephen Robinson, and on those Sundays when Stephen is not in the pulpit, we present a variety of speakers from this congregation or from the wider community. Unitarian Universalism is a diverse and non-creedal religion. We are a covenantal religion, which means we don't have to believe the same in order to treat each other the same with respect, equity, compassion, and dignity. Our community is based on deeds, not creeds. As Unitarian Universalists, we side with love, embracing all people regardless of age, color, <coughs> race, socioeconomic status, physical ability, or religious background. We especially invite families and young children, and we have a nursery. We are a welcoming congregation, which means we also embrace LGBTQ individuals. Now we encourage everyone to wear the name tags so that we may know each other better. Board members wear green name tags and they also always welcome your comments, questions, and suggestions. Would the members of our Board of Trustees please stand now so that you may be recognized. Thank you. At this time, we'd like to recognize any guests or, guests or visitors who are with us today. Now, visitors, we ask you to please fill out a visitor card and put it in the collection plate. There should be one in front of you in the back of the chair. That information will enable us to send you our newsletter, emails, and other information about events. We promise no one will come on an uninvited visit. Now, visitors, if you are willing and able, please rise and share with us your name and where you are from, or if you have guests with you, please feel free to introduce them. Richard will bring the microphone. Any visitors today? Well, Richard, you had an easy job. I didn't do a very good job, <laughs> did I? That's right. <laughs> okay, today's cellist lighter is Jean Lamasto. Good morning. The expectations at the UU are that you treat each others with respect, all others. In fact, others are welcome. These few words and their realization in action are a major attraction to this place for me. The secular elements in the celebration within the service and the political activism are components of a church that I can attend with good conscience. <coughs> Spirit of light and life, come unto us. Thank you, Jean. Now we'll have our musical meditation. This morning's musical meditation is Allegretto by Frank Bridge.
Yeah. Some visitors come in, and if, if you're willing and able, if you would. <laughs> we're, we're desperate this morning. Oh. We, we didn't. Go ahead, Richard. <laughs> Uh, well, where are they? In the back. Visitors in the back? Yeah. Oh. All right. So you, you come in a little late and we embarrass you by making you introduce yourselves. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, if you want to say who you are, where you're from, and who you are particularly. <laughs> yes. Hi, everyone. I came last week. My name is Catherine Baz, and I brought my husband and niece and the baby, Adonis. And thank you all for having us. Nice to meet you, everyone. Right. Thank you. <laughs> I want to thank Karen and Anna again. Thank you. It is with a great deal of pleasure that I'm going to introduce our speaker, who will speak later on. Uh, John Logue is married to Carolyn West. He's been a member of UUCC for about 10 years. He served on the board, a number of standing and ad hoc committees. John is retired as a distinguished professor emeritus in, in 2006 from USC Sumter. He taught over 40 years there. His graduate studies at U, were at USC and UNC, largely in the field of plant systematics and ecology. Now well, that's what John sent in. Uh, I'd like to add that he has a true passion for sharing. He's sharing his expertise, and he's the only person I know who can make an hour looking at a three-foot circle of Earth fun and educational. <laughs> I've ever done that with John. It's amazing. Any circle of Earth, sit there and you're there for an hour talking about it. John is also one of the most giving people that I know. And now John will give our opening words. Thank you, Phil. Uh, I'm going to start with a little uh, piece that came from an article in Psychology Today back in 2018. And it was uh, written by Dr. Mariana uh, Bakovova. Uh, and she lists seven components that she says are essential to an intimate relationship. Uh, the first of those is knowledge, that if you're in a relationship with partners or a number of other people, you share a vast amount of personal information with one another. That there is an interdependence uh, of the members that are in this group, and the interdependence has to do with each influencing the other in fairly meaningful ways that care is involved, that you're concerned with the other member's welfare, uh, do what you can to support that. There's a certain amount of trust involved in these relationships. That is, you're fairly confident of the behavior of your partner, although Carolyn might uh, differ with that. But uh, <laughs> uh, there is responsiveness. That is, you recognize needs in your partner and you try to respond in a supportive manner. And mutuality, that is, we change from thinking in terms of I and me to we um, and us. And finally, there's a commitment to the relationship. You have a desire that this relationship continue on into the future. Now, since I'm going to talk about environmental issues, you might wonder what this has to do with it, but I would submit that we need to have that kind of relationship with the environment that we live in. We depend on it. It also, in a way, depends on us. Thank you. Story for all ages. If we have anybody who'd like to come down for our story for all ages, Dr. Logue will deliver that. Yeah, you can, if you'd like. All right. I'm going to invite you to uh, do this. I'm going to invite you to participate in a little science experiment with you. 
Uh, this is a little bit of uh, hand sanitizer. And if you open the palm of your hand, I'm going to put a little tiny bit in it. Now, if you hold it there for a minute, and I'll do it in mine also, you'll notice that if you move it back and forth, it's like a gelatin. It's like a little bit of jello. But if it sets in your hand for a little while, it becomes liquid. And it's also cooling your hand a little bit because it's using energy or heat from your body to change from one state, a little solid state, into a liquid state. Now, if you take your hands and rub them together and wave them in the air, what do you notice? It's more cooler. Yeah, it gets cold. Because as it changes from a liquid and goes into a gas in the atmosphere, it absorbs a lot more energy. In fact, 540 times more than it takes to warm it up a little bit. That is a lot. That's a lot. And it also is how your air conditioner works. It's how the freezer in your uh, ice box works to make ice. And more importantly to us in this topic, if you sit under a shade tree, that process of evaporation, changing from liquid water to gas, is going under the leaves. So it's a lot cooler under the shade of a tree than it is under the shade of an umbrella. Thank you. Thank you, John. I'll go like this for a while. <laughs> if you have a significant personal joy, sorrow, or concern you would like to have shared from this pulpit, please phone or email Andrea, our administrator, by noon Friday. If you would like to speak for yourself before the service begins, pick up one of the candles in the basket on the entry table and come forward to speak briefly when requested. For those of you on streaming, if you would like to have a candle lit, please text or email Andrea, our administrator, to have it read during this service. Now, will those of you who have taken a candle please come forward at this time? Hi, I'm Kevin McKinney. And um, with Connie's permission, I'm going to light a candle to mark her um, completion and graduation from an 18-week course uh, with the Majeska Simpkins School, uh, looking at the history of this state through a, basically a justice lens. Connie can explain it better than I can. So it's a joyful occasion. We got to go to the graduation at the school um, last night. And, uh, and let me just editorialize a little bit that I'm so proud that she was able to take this course in order to address more fully our role as social action coordinators. So, well done, sweetie. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you everyone for having us here again. It's our second visit here with you guys. Um, we would like to light a candle today on behalf of our uncle who is struggling cur currently with some medical issues. Um, again, wonderful to be here with you guys and thank you so much. This is a candle of joy for Alvin. I was supposed to drive him in today, and he said that uh, he's got family coming in for his birthday. So we want to say happy birthday to Alvin. Happy birthday. And also, um, so glad to see uh, Peck here today. You're just really wonderful to have you here. So thank you.
And to say hi to, to Pat Moore and uh, Reverend Robinson, who are recovering from COVID. So we've got lots, lots going on. We light one final candle for those joys and concerns that remain silent in our hearts. Now to ponder these joys and concerns, let's pause for a moment of silent meditation. Thank you. This congregation contributes to share the plate where half of our cash collection each Sunday goes to local charities, a way for us to give back to the community we live in. This month's Share the Plate recipient is Justice 360. The mission of Justice 360 is to promote fairness, reliability, and transparency in our criminal justice system for individuals facing the death penalty and juveniles facing lengthy sentences in South Carolina. Millicent Land from Justice 360 will be here next Sunday. Now, if contributing by check, please write share the plate on the memo line, or you also may make an online contribution. For those of you streaming, we remind you that you also can contribute by using the link uh, on our UUCC website. Ushers, please come forward. Our offertory musical selection is The Leaf on Furling by John Carrado. We receive these gifts with gratitude and appreciation as it demonstrates that we are truly a giving community. It's been about 15 years since I've stood behind a podium and addressed a class. Um, so I'm not going to be comfortable unless you pull out your phones and uh, start engaging in social media. Uh, <laughs> since I'm primarily a botanist by training and an ecologist, uh, you're going to think this focuses a great deal on plants, but I assure you we are intimately related to them. Uh, I'll get into this a little bit later, but these are leaves off the same tree, same species. This one is in the shade, and this one it came from the top of the tree, and you might notice it's dead because I didn't feel like climbing to the top this morning. Uh, we're gonna talk about the differences between those and the fact that this plant can respond to its environment and is in a pretty intimate relationship with the seasons, with the weather, 
And not only is it related to those, it influences those things. Um, I know that you're cautioned about using cliches when you write or when you talk because they're usually obvious and not really creative. But there's one I can't resist. It says, you can't see the forest for the trees, right? And what it means is you can get so involved in the minutia that you don't get the whole picture. Well, I have a tendency to get involved in minutia, so we're gonna start off talking about the forest, and then we'll go to the minutia. If we look at the forest in the area that we live in, in this part of North America, there is a um, descriptive phrase used to describe what's known as climax vegetation. And that descriptive phase is that it's the eastern deciduous forest because most of the trees lose their leaves during the winter months. Uh, and the characteristic plants found in the mature forest usually referred to as oaks and hickories. Well, that's a fairly recent thing because if we go back, uh, you know, 50, 60 years, that same forest, a little bit longer than that, that same forest was referred to as a chestnut oak forest because chestnuts were one of the dominant trees in the climax forest along with the oak trees. Those are the two most common species. Well, you probably know that the introduction of a foreign species of chestnut brought in a blight that eradicated all of those chestnut trees. Now, the tree itself was prominent in our literature. It was a major uh, feature in the forest. And so the second most dominant tree were various species of hickory. Now, I say all of this to point out the fact that humans have had a great impact on the forest composition and therefore on the ecosystems that we live in. When Europeans first um, uh, loosely discovered or <laughs> this continent, there were people who lived here already. And the uh, ones who lived here had gone through a number of periods. Uh, if we go all the way back to the last time that the earth was covered in ice, or a good portion of it, the last ice age, the type of vegetation found in this part of the country was very different. Uh, we found that there were a number of trees that were needle-bearing leaves uh, because those are adapted to not lose too much water during the year, and they had to photosynthesize during the period of time when it was really cold. We've got a few of those left. Now, as things change temperature-wise, uh, we also found that the whole landscape of the environment changed. Uh, going back <laughs> close to a uh, million years, we would find that there were changes that were taking place in the movements of continents. And supposedly, the area that we're in of the state and this whole part of the southeast uh, was present as a system of island arcs that lay off the coast. And as the plates moved, the island arc system was driven up onto the main body of North America. And as it was driven up, we had lines of mountains that formed, the Appalachian Mountains, that at one time were as rugged and tall as the Rocky Mountains. Well, in a long period of time after that, the action of the environment on these mountains, the action of the climatic changes and the chemical things that take place in the rock eroded the mountains down and they began to move downward, southward, coastward, and all of the debris left behind is what we stand on today. We end up with four physiographic zones in the state. Coastal plain, which is fairly large and flat with several terraces in it. At the top of the coastal plain, a fairly tight delineation of the next zone, which is an area called the Fall Line Sandhills. And just beyond that, something called the Fall Line. 
and we are setting on the fall line. Fall line across the southeast is the zone where as rivers cut down, they uh, lose contact with bedrock. And so it's the place if you're coming up from the coast that you find rapids in the river. Well, we're at that zone. Beyond this zone is the Piedmont of the state, and these are eroded mountain ranges, and finally what we have left of the mountains. The process that we look at has been pretty clearly shown in a nice little film called Rivers of Sand. That is, if you took all of the waters out of the river, because we get precipitation that flows down toward the sea, what you would see is sand and rock moving down all of those streams. Uh, and essentially a river's worth of it. We know that in areas where uh, we have floods after heavy rains, uh, water goes out into the swamp forest in this area and it delivers a load of silt and sediment along with nutrients that were in those rocks. And so the forests that grow in those grow really fast, really tall, really big. If you've been into the Congaree National Monument, or park now, uh, what you note is that the trees are so tall and the canopy so close that in the early or late afternoon, it becomes almost dark there. Because those trees spread out and their job is to capture the sunlight that's falling on them and to manufacture food material. Uh, since I want to talk a little bit about forest, uh, we have a stratification in a forest. There are trees that grow really rapidly and put their leaves in the sunlight. There are trees that can't quite match that type of competition and so they can't get there fast enough and they become a subcanopy. And so there are trees that are always below those that can survive in shade. And then down below those are the trees that just can't compete at all. And so there are shrubs, forbs, and finally herbaceous vegetation on the floor. Well, they all have the same need. They need sunlight. Because within those plants, there is sort of a magic process that takes place. Uh, sort of like your solar panels on the house, they can take sun's energy and convert it into electrons that are moving between molecules. And the difference is, we just use the moving electrons for electricity. The plant has a very complicated array of chemicals that are associated with that green molecule that can trap that electron and ultimately use the energy from the process to split water molecules and to join the hydrogen or the protons from those molecules to carbons. Well, it so happens that all the rest of life, or at least the majority of it, is eager to pick up that combination, the carbon and the hydrogen. Because we have, mole we have little organs inside of each of our cells that can take that kind of molecule and break it apart and use it for all of the energy that we need to exhibit life. Right, so this is the basic food, food web that we look at within an ecosystem. If we look at this process, the process that manufactures the food that we need, we'll also see that there is some exhaust produced in the process. And one of the components of the exhaust happens to be something else that we need dearly, oxygen. The process of photosynthesis produces a waste stream of oxygen inside of one of these leaves, and it gets out of the leaf, but it also needs some carbon dioxide, which has to come into the leaf, and it also needs to have various kinds of nutrients, and they're sent up through the stem of the plant and out into this leaf and into its tissues. So we're gonna go inside of this leaf for a moment. Uh, further expanding before we get inside that leaf, uh, there are all kinds of communities 
of plants that occur throughout these four physiographic processes. There are liter literally hundreds of separate communities that are based, first of all, on the kind of plant life that are there, and secondly, the animals, the organisms that live in them also are unique. Um, these interrelationships are critical to the survival of things. So if we go into that swamp forest and look at the old climax forest before it was cut over, uh, there were always lots of old trees that were dying, and the recently old trees happened to be the source of food for um, the um, woodpecker, it just escaped my name. <laughs> Not palliated. No, palliated we still have. The uh, ivory bill woodpecker. Ivory bill woodpeckers are recently extinct, right? Because they had a niche, they had an occupation within this kind of Florida uh, forest that would take them to a tree that was recently dead, and so the bark was still sort of uh, intact. Uh, they would take a piece of this and peel it downward and look at the insects that were beneath it. Well, since we got rid of all of those and everything's suck at growth now, that particular occupation is no longer available. So the main reason that these organisms ceased to exist were changes within the natural ecosystem. And we are losing thousands, hundreds of thousands of species worldwide because environments, uh, ecosystems are being altered and changed. Trees are being cut down. The interaction between the species that were associated with those as the producer organisms are being altered so that many things are dying off without our knowing it. We're doing the same kind of thing in the ocean. All right, let's get to this uh, intimate relationship of the leaf. I think I dropped one of them. We said a minute ago that one of these is a shade leaf and the other one is a sun leaf. Well, if we look at it, about the only way to understand why there's a big difference in these two leaves that have exactly the same genetic or DNA makeup is to venture inside. And so I'm going to have you pretend that you're inside of a leaf. The people that are in the front part of this are inside of the sun leaf, right? And the people who are in the back with the lower ceiling are in the shade leaf. If you look at the ceiling overhead, that is the bottom of the outer layer, the epidermis of this leaf. And since we're blowing it up a great deal, they look like pieces of jigsaw puzzles, right? They're irregular in shape and size. They're fairly thin. They're still alive. On the inside of them is a fairly viscous fluid with all kinds of little inclusions in it. One of those inclusions that would stain darkly if you put uh, iodine on it or other biological stains is a big central body referred to as a nucleus. Around the outside of it, some of these other organelles, some of these other small organ-like structures, include the one that can take the carbon-hydrogen bonds, break them down, and produce energy. So it's sort of like the powerhouse of the cell, a mitochondria. We look up through this, and the leaf is green, and since we've removed everything, you can actually see through the epidermis. That is, it's somewhat translucent. It allows light to come through easily. And you can actually see out with a little blur. Main reason that it's not filled with the bodies that are green. And one of the reasons it does have green bodies up there is if the light is too strong, if there's too much energy coming in, it will destroy that chlorophyll molecule, right? So down below it, down below this zone, and by the way, that epidermis is covered with a thick layer of wax so that water can't be lost through the top of the leaf because it gets hot. Down below it, we're going to find a number of, uh, well, let's call them like plastic sacks, maybe as tall as I am and that big around. And they're filled with this fluid, but they're also filled with the green bodies 
that are located in that central area. And those are the things that trap the sun's energy and can manufacture the carbon-hydrogen bonds, the stuff we refer to as food. Except that if we are in the sun, so much light gets in that a lot of those green bodies are destroyed by the sunlight. And so there's a second layer of these things, and sometimes a third layer. The leaf is thicker because it has to account for the amount of light coming into it in order to carry out its function. If we drop down below those two or three layers, we're gonna run into some huge bundles of pipes that are running sideways and longitudinally throughout the leaf. And I'm gonna come back to those in a second. Remember, they're pipes that are just beneath that layer. Because down on the area just above the floor are these same kinds of big plastic bags of materials, but they've been jumbled all around. They're just all over the place. In fact, if you get up to the upper layer, you can sort of squeeze your hand in between those cells that are filled with chloroplast, and it's wet all around, but they're a little bit plastic, and they're side by side. Down here, we can get on our hands and knees, and we can crawl in between these sacks, right? There's a lot of space in here. So this is referred to as a spongy layer. Oh, I need to get back in front. Right. I used to wander around the room. You have to, uh, right? If um, you get down into the spongy layer, there's enough room so that you can squeeze in your whole body and go from one space to another. Now, those also have the green material producing food in them. But it's an area that is necessarily open because another thing that these plants need in order to produce food is carbon dioxide. And the carbon dioxide comes in from the atmosphere. So on the lower skin of the leaf, the bottom epidermis, we're gonna find the same puzzle-like cells that made up the upper epidermis, but these are not covered with wax on the lower side. And another important feature is that scattered all over the floor of this leaf, there are going to be little openings. And the openings are surrounded by some unique cells. Remember all of the puzzle-like leaves don't have chlorophyll in them, don't have the green material. But these little cells that are around the openings, each one of them shaped like a hot dog, has a thick inner layer on one side, the side that's closest to the opening, and they're filled with eight little green bodies, all right? So they're sort of unusual for this kind of skin. The reason those green bodies are there is because these little openings can close so that they shut off airflow and the loss of water, and they can also open to let the carbon dioxide in. So they're ventilation systems. Now I would submit that if the leaf is this big and we are walking around the floor, it's sort of like being in a hot shower. You crack a door to the outside and you'll feel an inrush of air because moist air, water is a whole lot lighter than oxygen and nitrogen, moist air flows out and the air from the outside flows into the leaf. It is a breeze coming in. It brings the carbon dioxide necessary to bathe all of these cells. Now, CO2 is soluble in water, and so it goes into the water that is on the outside of each cell, and the process then is manufacturing food. Now, we're gonna return to the bundle of pipes that are between that upper regular zone and the jumble ones below. What you see in the leaf, if you can look at the back of this, you see a number of ribs going through. These are the veins of the leaf. What you can't see very well is that each one of these bundles gets smaller and smaller as it branches out. And if you were to put it under a microscope, you would find that these are indeed like sections of a pipe, at least part of the uh, tubing. 
They are produced as the leaf goes from embryonic up to mature zone, and they are bringing water and nutrients up from the root system. The other kind of cell in this bundle of pipes is made up of sections, but each one of the sections is still alive. It doesn't have a nucleus in it. And right at where the junction between two segments is located, there's a little sieve plate so that the cytoplasm of one goes into another. These are elements of the tubes that pick up soluble sugars, those carbon-hydrogen bonds, move them out of the leaf down into the stem and toward the roots for storage. <laughs> so we have in something like this leaf uh, a very uh, intricate organization of cells and things that are associated with the production of food material stored in parts of the plants that we use. If we don't use it directly as food materials, other things eat it, and then we pick up those carbon-hydrogen bonds. That is, we are intimately related to this cycle of food production. We owe not only the food that we eat that's traveling through this web of life, but also the oxygen that we need for survival to green plants and green vegetation. Well, at this point, I'm reminded of a joke that someone told when I used to be a member of the Baptist church. We had revivals, and someone came in and said, uh, he didn't seem to know when to stop talking, <laughs> right? And so it would go on and on until people squirmed around and what have you. So he had a method that he used, and it was to take a lifesaver and put it in his mouth and over in the corner. And the time it took for it to dissolve without him moving it around was about the time that the sermon should last. <laughs> and that worked well until one day he reached in his pocket and put a button in there. <laughs> so... My lifesaver is about gone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, John. I invite you to join in our closing hymn. It's number 1052, The Oneness of Everything by Jim Scott, and it's located in the Teal Hymnal. I invite you to stand as you're willing and able, and please wear your mask while joining in congregational singing.
It's a song that I uh, really like now. In fact, it's sort of an earworm. I keep hearing the melody over it. It's a Joni Mitchell song, both sides now. And so I'm going to take the liberty to paraphrase a little of it. One of the verses. We've looked at lay leaves from both sides now. <laughs> from out and in and still somehow. It's leaf solutions we shall call. And we really don't know leaves at all. <laughs> I would urge you to, I guess our seventh principle says that we respect the interdependent web of life. Um, I would think that there's always a lot more to learn about this web of life and that in addition to respect, we need to protect. Thank you. Thank you, John. We extinguish this chalice at the end of our time here today. May its flame glow gently in our hearts and light our path as we leave this place until we are together again. Now we'll have our congregational benediction. like to remind you that July is our Voices of UCC month, featuring our own, including next week, Ivy Coleman, and then Laura Culler, Barbara Bates-Smith, and Mike Sullivan. This concludes our service. You're welcome to stay and visit outside and unmask at your option on the patio through the double doors off the social hall. Thank you.